be drunk and I'll talk about what to do when somebody accuses you of that live. <laughs> Well, given that we are live and have spent the last five minutes battling absolute Sorry, everybody. Yeah, it was at my drama. End. Good morning, LinkedIn. It's oh, afternoon, evening, if you're in the UK. Uh, it's very nice to see you all here today. I'm here with Max McEwen, and we've spent the last six, five, six minutes dicking around. What's going on this morning, Max? Are you drunk? I'm not, actually, although that would be fun, wouldn't it? I mean, not necessarily live, but alcohol has been associated with creativity. Creativity <laughs> is associated with better results. And actually, it's interesting you say that, because what a big difference between, like, looking good and following the best practice and actually getting shit done. You could have a difference <laughs> between those things, couldn't you? you? I mean, if you look at the, the starting point of any of those big brands that people talk about endlessly, coca-cola and apple and tesla and you actually look at what happens i mean musk makes it clearer he's there smoking on his weed um get, getting high being crazy it's not all steady uh, steady as you go is not the only way of doing shit well no it isn't and actually i was reading i was uh so i spent last week no. Oh, my time has gone very weird. I've just had two weeks off and this is my first day back at work. And so my concept of time is all over the place. But two weeks ago, I spent the week in a self-imposed retreat, finishing yep. uh, my, my second book. But one of the things that I was writing about is about... Oh, wait, hold um, on, Alicia. Was that your second book? Yes. <laughs> Do you want to have a look? Congratulations. Well done, you. Second book. Thanks. You can have a look at it when it's all was yeah, together. It's yeah, well done. Why not? Thank you. Uh, but one of the things I write about in the book uh, is about strategic influence uh, and how to have impact at scale. And I went down a rabbit hole, as you do, which you will know very well when you're researching a book and you have an idea about something and then you wind up five hours deep inside a Google trail about things that you never expected to learn about. Uh, but I was reading about what makes a brand valuable and how you assess the value of a brand and what the expectations or demands of the public or of your consumers are um, to create that value. And for brands like Apple and IBM and Coca-Cola, it's, um, it's really shifted what we expect of a brand. And so just having, um, having the right features and benefits or connecting with us is no longer what we want. We want... Um, brave, courageous, values-driven, world-changing stuff out of our brains now, apparently, according to the yeah, latest interbrand I, I think that we should, should we not store the apparently? The, I, yes. I think there's this huge difference may, maybe or a potential gap or we shouldn't assume there isn't a gap between what we, some people, experts particularly, marketing experts, HR people, think we want and what actually people buy because there's a difference but i don't think that we know what we want do we you and i both know that what we think we assess performance or effectiveness by is not true so we think we value competence but we don't we value likability and we think we value the features of a product but we don't we we actually value how it makes us feel who we are as a person and you know so it, this becomes this bizarre little amorphous blob of stuff because well, no one else probably really understands what we want but neither do we yeah no not all the time there's and there's always that potential gap between what we say or what somebody claims is important and what they do of course there is when you come to I tell you who this is hard for. You know who it's hard for, this whole, we don't know what we want, you don't know what we want, you can't trust any of it. It's politicians. This is who it's hard for. Um, because they're trying to guess what we actually want and deliver that in a way that makes us want them. And there's so many different layers of guessing going on in there that, like, I've almost got some compassion. So we've got a general election a national yeah. election in, in New Zealand, and we're just firing into election mode now. So our elections are in, uh, I don't know, September, October. I can't remember if COVID's shifted that. And um, and everybody's gearing into election mode now, and they're all doing their best guess of what we want out of them and what we don't want out of the other. And it's quite fascinating as a study of human behaviour to watch just adults and the way they behave in that arena. 
Well, particularly in that arena, because everybody can be in there and all you really need is an opinion. You don't need any <laughs> evidence. You don't need track record. You could just have a big lie that works. I mean, there's, there are, there's information that flows. We, we were walking around a lake today and people were feeding the swans bread. And that, that doesn't seem such a good idea. Or in the UK, uh, it has one of the lowest compliances with face masks in the world. And nobody quite knows why. So why does some information travel and affects behavior and becomes embedded and some information doesn't? Uh, you know, who decided that women were emotional, for instance? Uh, so <laughs> these uh, uh, and weren't as reliable. Who decided that? Who decided that? So, so some information Have you read, um, some stick. What's that book? Made, made to Stick. Have you read Made to Stick by the Heath Brothers, where they talk yeah. about what makes an idea sticky? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I'm trying to remember what the components of it are. It has to be relevant and reach on a personal level. It has to be but interesting. Then, yeah. And then there's idea virus, that, that kind of idea. And then an idea is the Dawkins thing. Idea is a meme. But what travels or, or mind making ideas easy to swallow. But what what travels and then what stays and then what becomes a, a habit. And I, I mean, a lot of the work that I do is trying to help people to move beyond just filling in their next document and actually move to something that they'd like to do, like they'd like to achieve, figuring out what the desirable end is and how to get there. And then all those defensive routines that, that stop them getting there. I mean, I imagine there's easier work. I, it yeah, appears, well, maybe. Yeah. But I like that. And one of my favourite things to do client-wise is just to run thought experiments because I think if we're talking about what makes an idea stick or flow or travel, um, what what happens is it becomes part of a, a story or part of a narrative. And the problem mm. with ideology or with a story is that we stop realising that some of those things are assumptions and we start to accept them as just the way things are and we build on top of those, right? Yeah. And so finding ways to just put cracks in some of that ideology and go, but what if... What if that wasn't true? So I had an idea yesterday um, on, oh my God, Max, we took our three kids on a road trip for a week in the rain and it was just ridiculous, but we can come back to that. But anyway, an idea I had in the car yesterday <laughs> well, was to maintain my final pieces of sanity. Uh, was some of the problem with the political cycle is, because, oh, that's right, because we were passing election hoardings, you know, big billboards of, just ridiculous slogans that are clearly supposed to have people go, yeah, too right. And I was, and one of them is we've got a new conservative party that's been established for the election, as happens. Uh, and they were saying, zero carbon, no thank you. Helping farmers, yes, please. And I went, oh, like it was quite distasteful. But then I thought, wouldn't it be good if the story we had around politicians or the expectation or the narrative we had as a society wasn't that they serve us? What if our expectation was that they were only able to make decisions that had a 10 or 20 plus la year lag on their effectiveness? And so we'd say things like, oh, did you see the new act? Yeah, it's a nightmare, but, you know, it's not about us, is it? You know, that's, that's the thing about politicians. They don't help you today, but they're good for the grandkids. Like, imagine if that was our expectation. What yeah. that, and it, it wouldn't take much. It's just a story, right? I, I, it's just a story that we've created. We are, as part of an election, we've gone, who's going to put more, 20 more dollars in my pocket next week? How dumb is that? I, I think you always have a, a challenge between those who go for the very simple message because what they're good at is reflecting what their natural audience wants. So yeah. they are that they became influential because they reflected what their audience wanted. Wherever they come from, they just say the shit that people around them say. <laughs> it's a bit like I don't mean necessarily that it is shit. I, it's just no, it is shit, Max. Yeah, There's a the couple of them that were like prisoners oh, voting. No thanks. Oh, and they've heard, remember they've tested that by the time. I don't just mean in the modern sense of testing the behavioural responses online. I mean. They have naturally been attuned to, I say this, this is the reaction. Just like a comedian gets a laugh, this totally. the politician gains power because they get to reflect and copy what is good. So I may think, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why are you saying it? But they're saying it because it's played well to an audience and they may not even know that. 
And I think the challenge for those of us who want to sit back from that and deliberately change something is, of course, it's harder. It is harder to change something in an effective way because we are not hearing that. We're not hearing that demand. We're having to make that demand. We're not just hearing those phrases. We're having to improve those phrases to get somebody somewhere and overcome defensive routines. So, so you've got to make them up. You can't just harder. mirror it. Yeah. Well, you could. I mean, McKinsey at the moment, I, I'm not really knocking them, but apparently they've done hundreds of millions of work on the current global panic. But is that why are they getting that work? Is that because they're really delivering the very best answers? Is that because they're trying to change things in an effective way? Or is it because they're very good at creating a dependency and mirroring what people want to, to hear at the right time in the right way so they feel part of them? And if you compare that kind of work with, say, the Black Lives Matters work, which could fade, could fade away because it's not mirroring the, the concerns of some of the people who aren't affected in power. by it. Yes, it, right. indeed. And they, they then run out of energy for that. So McKinsey take you when you're, as an example, when you're in pain and they sell you the thing that makes sense for you to look good and sleep well as a senior leader. But oh, perfect. And they and they sell you security, right? And safety. So and here when I see people using big consulting houses or the big four, it's not so much that they have absolute faith in what the findings of any of the workers, it's that they know that if those findings have been presented on the right letterhead, they've they've got a sense of safety in being able to back those. So rather than having to have confidence in their own ideas, they can say, Well, we got we got good advice. We got this report and therefore our decision making was on the basis of good advice. So you can't hold me accountable if it goes wrong. Yeah, the, the old idea of you can't be fired for buying IBM, that there are some yeah. safe choices that, that you could go through a lot of pain to decide. But in the end, you only pick the market leader every time or, or one of the two market leaders. And you went Amazon rather than Microsoft for your cloud computing and don't really solve the problem. And this it, clearly this is always a challenge. If you want to help people make progress, you are trying to solve a, a more difficult thing. It doesn't have to be painful, but it's intellectually more demanding, uh, I think. And it's Absolutely. our job, I think, to make it less painful and easier to sell and mirror enough to get in the room in order to, to make a difference. But again, it's about changing the story or the expectation or the narrative around what it is that you expect. Because if what you expect is a good report, well, shit, you and I could bang one up this morning for someone, couldn't we? We could write something down. Here you are. Here's some ways to think and some things you should do. I mean, mm. yay for you. But if your expectation of working with somebody is that it's going to deliver um, one or two new things, we're going to change the way that we act or decide in this space, or we're going to be different in some way. If that's your expectation, it's a completely different way to assess performance. And it's the same with the politicians. Like, I just keep thinking about it, that imagine if the, the public expectation was that politicians didn't serve us today. And so that at an election, they were going, well, that might sound nice today, but that's not what we're looking for, is it? What's the 25-year effect of this one? Like, what if that was the, the expectation? How good would that be? That's interesting. It, it, it's also interesting that it, you, you mentioned framing, to the, the idea of looking at different levels. It, people always find that easier, different, uh, different horizons in scenario planning or d different levels from, the, look, this is the basic and this is the, 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 lux the super duper and this is the luxury to helping people with language that allows them to choose and say, look, that, that's safe, that, that's lovely. But, and I think that's part of our job too, to help people in language that they do understand pursue better uh, if they can. And that's what you're doing. Oh, totally. And the, I mean, the power of a frame is incredible, isn't it? And that really the task of the of the idea maker or the idea spreader, if we come back to the idea of trying to make something stick, is, is to create a frame that hooks onto another one enough that it can be tolerated and processed. So even if we've got the most radical idea, we have to be able to hook it onto a known framework of understanding in some way so that people can grab at it. It's like why we're scared of spiders, right? Because they're just so foreign from us that we just cannot get it through our heads. 
that that thing's okay. There just needs to be a bridge, you know, between the spider and the human, or between the the crazy radical idea and the one that we already. I just accept, like the idea of spider body. bridges. That's like toad tunnels, you, you know, yeah. and, and hedgehog the, the trapezes or something. The the idea of moving from one place to another, but but absolutely. So use your experience to not just be say cynical or spot the error. But say, I don't know, people are using an agile framework. People are using some HR best practice. But how can you use that language to, to allow them, everybody to feel comfortable and then make progress? And, and then so, bleed at the edges. Yeah. Well, plus I, said to my, I said to my partner about this bloody holiday we just went on. Oh, honestly, we stayed in a holiday park in a cabin and it just mm. rained. And, anyway. And I said, look, it's not a holiday. It's it a trip. Good. You enjoy it. We must that. frame this we must frame this as a trip <laughs> and not as a holiday because the expectations that come with the idea of a holiday are quite different to what you get with seven days in the car with three children. So if we think of it instead as a trip, <laughs> we'll have more realistic expectations for how our days will go. <laughs> a, a commute to a commute to, child, <laughs> to a childcare hell. But what we, a challenge. Yeah, maybe. A yeah. I, I was just thinking yeah. about how often that there's a famous story. Did, did we discuss it? That the psychologist is going on holiday and ends up somewhere with all his family, and they realise that nobody wanted to go, and that that's what that, that reminded me of. And they only find out later that nobody really wanted to go uh, to the place at all. They would have rather just stayed at home and hung out, and they everybody did it for everybody else. And that's again, yeah. How I think we had an element of that except that my teenager was quite clear, quite unequivocal about her position, about whether she would like to be on holiday with us for the week, uh, and she did not. <laughs> but she came. But she came with you anyway. Well done, Alicia. Congratulations. Because she had to. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Okay. So thinking about um, what, makes, what makes an idea powerful and what makes – a brand resonate and stick. I detected some scepticism earlier around the idea that people are demanding um, some kind of value connection from, from ideas or from brands. Do you not think that's true? Well, I, I think that we shouldn't take it, assume that it is, or assume that we're communicating that accurately. So the, the, there's both sides. There's, I guess, what somebody wants as a sell they say they want food to look healthy, so you write some healthy stuff on, um, or they want their food to be good to animals because nobody wants to buy cruel food, you know, food that has been cruel to animals. And there's just a gap between what is sold and what is bought, and we see this quite a lot. So, so the idea, I guess, as a company is you have to be able to uh, deliver the good for you uh, I think, much more than for the consumer. I think you have to say, look, we would like to do this in a good way as opposed to um, have that fight, as opposed to just we want to look good to, to the outside world because the outside world may not be paying any attention. You know, you have to have the energy burning inside and then get those benefits. If you want an equitable organisation, if you want a green organisation, if you want a renewable organisation, you got to do that for, for you and the people inside not just to get awards, plaudits and sales. Are people paying attention? Hard to tell. Well, that's the difference between selling something and bringing people along, isn't it? Mm. So I've been thinking about this distinction a little bit, which is if you're a brand, you only need to get as far as buy my thing, right? Just give me your money and buy my thing. And I think that's, in many ways, a lot easier than trying to activate people. To, to follow you and to change their behaviour and to change their thinking. It's a, it's a completely different threshold of influence and engagement. Like, sure, I can get you to buy my thing, but what I really need you to do is to believe it and to make it real and to do something with it and to spread it and promote it. And the, the threshold for activation is quite different than the threshold for engagement. And... I've been sort of flirting with some ideas around what that really what the 
the magic, the golden egg of, of activation is how do we how do we get there? And you know, there's there's some great stuff around tribe building and around how you engage people in a movement. Um, what what I've found most interesting around the activation stuff is how few people we really need. Like it's it's not a numbers game. So when it comes to like if we go back to the political stuff, when it comes to regime change, citizen initiated revolution, the magic number, the magic tipping point is 3.5% of the population. If you can activate 3.5% of the population, there is this magic tipping point where it's almost guaranteed that you will get regime change. And I'm not sure that that same number extrapolates out to organisational change or to idea, um, to, to the idea factory, but... No, it, I suppose it always depends on which 3.5%, for, for instance. Does it? I think that the, 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 what resonates with, with the, what I've looked at is that you don't need everybody to, to agree with something in order to, to tip foot forward. Uh, you need, for instance, if you, you split a company up into 10 groups, you only need just over half of each of half of the half. You don't need everybody to agree. And if you get the people who are in power to agree, you need even fewer, perhaps, even though you need Correct. flow. So you need, don't need everybody, but you do need do you need a fair few to, to, to come with you? So I suppose you're looking at the independence in a political sphere, for instance. You're looking for the three to five percent who tip the election, who are reachable rather than those who are not reachable. Yeah. Well, because most people just sort of go along with things, don't they? Like if you think about Apple and you think, sure, there are a few people that sleep outside the shop before the new iPhone comes out. And then there are a few people who write scathing blogs online about how the iPhone is absolute shit. And then most people just sort of cruise along and buy an iPhone at some point and use their phone and it just is. And I think we, we, we have unrealistic expectations when it comes to, so if we've got an idea that we're really excited about or something we want to change, we're like, why doesn't everybody care about this as much as me? Mm -hmm. think, well, what if you just got 10 other people who cared half as much as you and you built deep, meaningful connections with those people. You resourced those people in a way that made it possible for them to go and spread. And you niched your communication and influence in such a way as to bring those people in even further and even deeper. You know, it's that whole 1,000 true fans, uh, Kevin Kelly theory, where what if we just did that? What's the 3.5% uh, from a regime change sense that when it comes to a new idea in a society or in, a, uh, in an organisation? I don't know the number, but I'd like to. But I, yeah, regime change. I, I suppose I, I'm always in it. It depends. I mean, it, whatever gets you through the night person. Uh, and I think that, I mean, you're, you, you're, you, 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 were saying, I think you were saying online, weren't you? Your energy was the thing that people put energy and confidence. So I think it just uh, d depends on the situation and seeing whether you need, is it 3% you need in order to tip? The, the balance between this group and this group, or is it repurposing a very popular phrase? Uh, and that that's the phrase that already has currency. Well, certainly what you're talking about is, you know, I talk about nurturing ideas as babies. Uh, but oh, before... I do like that. My favourite thing you've ever written is that ideas are like babies, ugly and not done yet. I just, I just love you that. I use that ugly, all the yes. time. Yeah, and not finished yet. And the baby yeah. starts before really idea sex happens before that. You know, you got idea sperm, ideas eggs, whatever. They've got to get together. So that first I'm all about this metaphor. And then you've got to, but then the doubling. So you've, what you're <laughs> describing, you know, you start from that to that level, they combine, and then you double and double and double and double, and you end up with a baby. And then the baby is born, but the baby is still not finished yet. And the baby becomes 10 and 20 and has crises, but is still not finished yet and is available for connection with other humans. So I suppose if you're always doubling you, your partner who's there, you know, you're working with somebody to make sure that the techs work, that's doubled your influence. And some of the all the people you're talking about, the regime people, they're looking for increasing their influence. 
and taking on what is already influential, the clothes, the Gandhi type thing, dressing for effect. When he's in London, he wears a pinstripe suit and is a lawyer. When he's in India, he, he wears robes because that suits the acceptable view of an influential person. Martin Luther King, he's speaking words from, from the Bible because that resonates with his group. But Trump even, you know, I'm clearly no Trump fan, but he, he is a Fox grandpa and he is, appeals to Fox grandpas because that's who he is. So if that's the high point. So I think we can learn a lot from all of those things about what, what does it take for an idea to be nurtured? Uh, and part of that is what, what allows our idea to kind of pass to the next stage, the next barrier. So what, what is it? Do, you know, with chemicals, how do you get them into the brain? You have to wrap them up and get them through the, the blood brain barrier. And so you have to understand how to wrap them up. And you're doing that naturally, clearly at the moment, you know quite naturally how to get your ideas and your services into a, an organization. You come from there, you know their point. Wrap it up. And you wrap That's it up. Nice. I was thinking uh, last week, oh, like I say, time is weird, the week before, when I was writing the book, I was I went off on a daydreamy metaphorical journey about how writing a book is like having a baby. But particularly writing a second book is like having a second baby because you kind of forget until crunch time what it's really like. And so it's been long enough since the last one that you romanticise the idea of it. So, you know, your first child gets to 18 months old and you're like, oh, I miss when they were a baby. Oh, it's really sad. We should have another baby. So you have another baby and it's all well and good until like a week before you're due to go into labour. And then you go, oh, shit, and you get this flashback and you remember what it's like. And then you, and then you get your baby and you're like, oh, this is bloody hard, this is a nightmare, how have I forgotten the sleepless nights and the drama and the, it's kind of like that with the book, like I was really excited about it and then I remembered what that final push was actually like. <laughs> ah, forgive the... Yeah, with, 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 with birth comes amnesia or nobody would have another yeah. child and, and I suppose... And then, like, you, you love it, you love it a lot but also you kind of have to because it's yours and if you don't, you just put it in the bin and then nothing works. And it's like that with babies. And then you've got to have two babies, though, too. That, that's the next thing you'll have. Your book will come out into the world. And now that book, unless it replaces oh. the first one, you have to oh. now have two. And you have to that's decide right. who's your favourite. Now, if it replaces the first one, that's OK. But if you want to kind of keep both alive, uh, how, <laughs> which if it was... <laughs> You're going to you want to, you know, who's your favourite? It, you're both and you sort of want the first one has like eased the way and, and sort of looks after the second one a little bit, or they, they can at least play together. And then yeah. I just had this lovely metaphorical extension while you were saying that and thinking, and then one day, some time from now, those babies will have babies of their own. Aww. And we'll see thinking come into the world when they join up with somebody else that yeah. uses that. Well, that citation, that shoulder of giant stuff, really, isn't it? That, that is babies having babies, having babies uh, uh, and get, getting together. And I guess people who are positive say we can shape that deliberately to do some good uh, as opposed to just evolution and ideas having their path, whether they create chaos or not. And they do create chaos. But, but we're and I mean, the thing is, like I put the same ingredients into all three of my children and, and I feel like I've parented them in mostly the same way and they're all completely different. So like you've got as much input as you can into the germination <laughs> of mm. an idea for a baby. But once it's out in the world and it's doing its own thing and walking around and interacting with other things, you lose a bit of control over the shape well, that the takes, more influential you? your book is or your idea or your movie, what, you know, your creation, the more influential it is, the less control, of course, you have over it because... I mean, people talk, novelists talk, um, our world is not our own. We don't own it anymore. It's, it's gone off and grown up and people are writing fan fiction and they're, they're writing whether that's erotic fan <laughs> fiction or, or whatever, <laughs> and they have no control over it anymore. And that's good and bad. They interpret it the way they interpret it. And then you have revisions and somebody does an exact copy, Marvel copy, DC and DC copies Marvel and people who only follow one of those comics think that it's original and maybe all of that stuff. So, so yeah, you don't have control, but it is fascinating seeing where it all comes from. This is lovely. I've really enjoyed getting together on a Monday morning to make idea babies with you, Max. 
Well, you know, it, it, it's been it's been good. It's been good. <laughs> you, you accuse me of being drunk. That you have to <laughs> throw me off. Um, well, you uh, did sort of MP. stumble in. You the, stumbled uh, in at nine oh one for a nine o'clock broadcast, and it was a little bit like that. Bear in mind, I suppose, that two things. Two things that uh, one, it's not nine oh one, is it? When I started, <laughs> it was ten oh one. So what you do <laughs> is breezily start your day on a Monday while interrupting my Sunday night. I think that <laughs> you know there is a different way of telling this story. So so far, <laughs> you've insisted what four or five times that Max gets up and oh, is that a okay? <laughs> Is that a problem? Get kind of Valley Girl, the New Zealand thing. Is that okay with you? <laughs> yeah, I don't mind interrupting you. So, so first of all, let's. And there might be a reason if I was drinking that I might drink on a Sunday night on my weekend. There might be, which I'm not. So there's that. Hey, look, I want to. I know we're running down to, to here, but the, if somebody makes it this far through our highly entertaining chat. <laughs> um, the, my, my thought this week was merely that the opposite of strategic, and you know I spend my time strategy and innovation, is tragic. The opposite Ooh. of strategic is tragic. The opposite Ooh. of strategy is tragedy. And that goes pretty deep in, in the end Ooh. because tragedy, as we know, is about where one flaw, really, where one flaw in your hero uh, leads to uh, a sorry end, just at one. It could even be their strength that leads to that. And the opposite really is. So in this country, we have tragic leadership, not strategic leadership. And, so, uh, uh, and that really is the difference because the wise strategist looks forward and says, how can I influence people? How can I influence that longer scope? And how can I influence the, the scale of change here? That's what somebody does. The strategist with his strategic arrow, that's the arrowhead, those three things. And uh, by hitting that kind of target, they overcome the tragic and deliver the strategic. Oh, that's a lovely thought to close on. Tragic and strategic. I'm going to sit with that. I'm going to have some idea sex with that. Yeah. Have idea sex yeah. all you want with that idea. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that I mean, very much. <laughs> I don't need my permission to, to, have, yeah, to, to do anything, uh, let alone my <laughs> yeah, uh, All right, so we you made it all the way to the end of our um, erotic ideas session. We do appreciate your attendance and we yeah, would just, love just cut it. Just cut it and put that bit at the start, yeah? All right. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'm but absolutely going to do it. You should. It. Yeah, 10 minutes <laughs> of that was worth listening to. I definitely think it was. <laughs> All right. Well, have a fantastic day. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.